in the 21st century Hard-working people Working hard for you and me Moving higher Time and time again Through the years you'll find us here Moving higher Hello and welcome to Moving Iron Podcast number 192. This week my guest is Rich Pawson and Rich is with Critical Point Podcast and Rich has been a guest on this podcast for, I don't know, going on a year and a half or almost two years now and he's the guy I go to when I want to talk about the economy. So Rich, how you been, man? Good, and yourself? No, not too bad. Well, there's plenty of stuff going on in, around the world. Um, you know, this 2019-2020 uh, has been a, uh, been a, a crazy ride, so... Uh, Three things I want to hit on today. One is I want to look at some uh, some precious metals and some oil, kind of see what you happen there. Then just kind of what your thoughts are overall when you start looking at the environment, or the environment, the the uh, economy, both in the U.S. Um, and and the rest of the world. And uh, I want to talk to you a little bit about what we see happening in China. So uh, let's start with China first. So uh, China is um, back and forth on scheduling a a date about what's going on with the. Uh, the phase one deal, and they're supposed to kind of have a get together about where they're at as far as how much they have or haven't um, uh, gotten from the U.S. as far as quantities go. Um, they have been buying a lot here of late, but quite frankly, the U.S. is the only place on, in the in the world that you can buy grain right now. Because as I look around, I've read a lot of articles about Argentina, um, the EU, Brazil, um, wanting to lift tariffs on on uh, imports of of grain because uh you know they say they they need to build their supply a little bit and i think a lot of it is because they've sold a lot of it to the chinese um eu's a little different they've had some pretty epic drought they just had their the eu's version of the usda ratcheted back their crop outcome by 50 percent, so that's a big deal but you know i guess as you take a look at the stuff we see here with the three gorges dam and the and and all this all the uh the flooding we see over there. I read an article about uh, how that was. If something catastrophic were to happen with that dam, that that fifteen percent of the world's manufacturing would be uh, uh, directly impacted uh, because of the areas down the uh, downstream that are um, heavily into manufacturing. So, I guess as you take a look at all those scenarios, just throughout there, Rich, what's your thoughts and 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 what do you see happening right now? Yeah, let's uh, touch on Brazil first, uh, okay. just quickly. Um, the uh, of course, Brazil is working on lowering their tariffs or, or actually uh, temporarily doing away with them so they can import more soybeans. And, and that could actually benefit Argentina and Paraguay on soybeans, but could benefit the U.S. more. And then Uruguay could benefit on the rice side relative to Brazil. But I'm concerned, is this a little like blowing smoke here that, yeah, they say they, they've got enough supply, but they're just trying to play it safe so they don't get any higher food costs for their own people domestically. And they don't want to see their own inflation going up. And Brazil has worked very hard at keeping down inflation. And, of course, they had a severe recession recently there that, that knocked it down. And I think they're just feeling, boy, we really don't want that to go back up even if the economy is getting better. Uh, but I'm a little bit puzzled. In 2016, their inflation was about 8.7%. Uh, 2017, it dropped down to about 37 And then it's been around that 3% area into this year, although I did find for the month of July it was actually like 2.7% which seems pretty low. You know, I would not be concerned of inflation popping up somewhat, especially relative to their history. So I wonder what else is going on. And I, I think ultimately they oversold on the export market. Uh, they just sold like crazy to China, get it while it's hot. You know, they had a leg up relative to China or U.S. Let's face it, the trade war here to U.S. shot us in the foot. We lost business and Brazil just saw the opportunity and went for it. And why wouldn't they? But they've probably tightened things too much in their own country. And so you now at least got the government people worrying, well, let's not get the people upset. Let's not raise some costs. And then, like you pointed out, that over in Europe, they have some issues with some of their crops. And, of course, uh, Brazil and, and Argentina are big traders uh, with Europe. Uh, I think relative to prices and commodities in this country, I don't think the, the whole tariff thing in Brazil. It seems like I've seen some of that in the past, and, and I look at a chart and I'm saying, well, where is it? You know, Show me how it really changed our prices. So we may get some nice business with them, but it's going to be temporary. It's seasonal. I think Brazil's just making a seasonal adjustment uh, on their supply and demand because 
they, they sold way too much and too fast probably. And But who can blame them? They went for the business while it was there, right? Right, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. But, but no, more crops are coming. So it's like a, if I'm a commodity producer in this country, I can't get too excited over that news. How much is it really going to – I'm not saying it can't impact. It's not going to make the – difference of a move versus a small move or something like that. I think it's just going to blend in uh, with everything else. Now, as we swing to China relative to commodities, we know that gorgeous dam break is going to impact like 58 million people. As you said, it could be 15 percent of global manufacturing relative to China. So it can make a significant impact there. So it's it's a serious situation. It's a, a real concern. A lot of engineers are saying if that thing goes, you're not going to see anybody wanting to build a gigantic dam ever again. So right. it could be a real major problem. But as best I can tell for crops, uh, relative to all the flooding that related to, to that dam story, is is there might be like 15 million acres or something like that. So it, it doesn't sound that significant. And I don't think it's really a soybean corn story as much as maybe rice and some of the others. Although some believe that some of the, the export business or, or um, the, the commodity processing business may actually have some serious storage in those areas. And I don't know well enough of breaking things down and um, but I do know it could impact 20, if it, if it, if it, yeah, it's impacting 27 to 31 provinces. So think of that like states here in the U.S. That's right. pretty significant, a lot of people. So it's serious for them, but I question how much is it really boost the need to import corn and soybeans. And we have seen some nice improvement in corn uh, sales to, to China. But I think, yes, it could be some of that. It could be some fear and some concerns. And so they want to get stuff booked and stay ahead of it. But some of it is probably trying to catch up. With the phase one trade deal, um, I don't have a chart of that in front of me, but I saw a really nice chart here about two weeks ago, and it just showed they're running like the, the, the chart basically added all commodities in the phase one. It's a huge amount of types of commodities, includes energy, and it showed like, man, they were two-thirds off the market trying, trying to meet phase one. Now, my guess is they're probably doing better than that maybe in, in the beans lately of picking up, but in general, they're way behind on phase one. And now we're coming up to election. Do, if you're China, do you not care and wait and see if Trump's reelected and who are you going to deal with and are you going to have to deal with it? I don't know. I mean, if you look at the pace of what we're selling them right now, you would say, yeah, they're trying to get it done for the election or they're not even thinking election. They're just trying to get it done and, and meet to what they agreed to, you know. But on the other hand, is it suddenly going to dry up in the next few weeks where they back off and wait to see uh, what happens with the election? Do you think? Do you think there's a, a possibility that they are looking at at what they're doing here as far as buying um, commodities go? That there could be some just fear of this the, of the dam issue, and because I mean the area that that the dam that the Three Gorges Dam is affecting is is their is basically like their 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 Midwest, right? So huh? it's yep. a it's a heavily irrigated or a heavily heavily agronomic, uh, agronomic area for China, and there's a there's a lot of that, a lot of effect there where they they might not even get a crop period from anything they're growing. So they could just be the fact that they're just trying to offset what they normally got just just with with the imports yeah. from the U.S. Do you mean there, there could there be some of that going on? You think? No, oh, I think I think it's a definite part. I think it's a common. I, and if you're sitting there looking at a, that potential of a natural disaster, you're thinking, okay, you got to protect yourself. You got to keep your food supply. You got to meet your obligations. So you want more commodities, but at the same time. You're sitting there looking at this phase one trade deal that you know you're running behind on. Mm-hmm. And it's kind of like it's one thing on top of another, on top of another, where suddenly you say, we got to get some things bought ahead. And, I, you know, I think it, I think it's a combination, really. And uh, so and then so I guess I don't know anything about the hydraulic system <laughs> of how all that water flows when if the dam is going to break, if it holds, what is the uh, how long before you say, OK, the whole situation's over now. Where's our final result? And I think that'd be a good question to start asking. What is, what is the timeline for this? And, and and maybe that's they do seem. I kind of thought maybe they were being more aggressive, trying to catch up with phase one. But you you could be right. They might be getting rather emotional here, of making sure they've they're gonna they're gonna buy something anyway. So suddenly you buy it now, right? Right. Make sure you're done. Which always that kind of relates to how I look at economics. I keep everybody wants to talk about just the S and Ds and supply and demand, and I'm thinking that's not really the most important picture. It's really what do people want to pay and what 
when do they need to do it? How aggressive will they be? And that's if you can study that part, which is available demand, available supply, and that's what I focus on. If you can study that, then you start explaining why prices suddenly surge when you really weren't expecting, even if you were optimistic or bullish, even if you had the S&D, you still were not expecting price to move that way. And uh, you can see that prices overshoot and undershoot the fundamentals all the time. And it's just because we get all businesses get caught at some point where they're saying, I got to get something bought and I don't care what the economics say. I need it. I got to keep the factory running. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, yep. No. Yep. So I'm, I'm thinking there's some built into that. Um, but I question where we're going long term. I, I think I'm really concerned. We've really got some permanent damage done here over this, this trade war, frankly. So, uh, and it's only, you know, by early next year, Brazil's going to be ready to refill the bins again. So, <laughs> right. Yep. So hopefully we get whatever we can get here, but I just feel like even if we get some fantastic numbers and everybody says, see, we're already back. We got record exports. I just feel like the overall timeline for what we lost last year and you know, getting in all this trade war, I wonder if we'll ever get to the record that we would have deserved if we hadn't done anything. Yeah. But, um, you know, that's something we're going to debate a long time from now. That doesn't mean we should have never done the trade war. I, I do understand um, why Trump wanted to go down this road, especially on business and intellectual property. Uh, you know, we've been falling behind for, for some time and uh, China was just getting more bold and faster and faster business. And uh, I sat about a month ago, I sat in on a teleconference call with um, put on by Reuters and it was Tony Blair, uh, the former prime minister, I think it was of England. And uh, it was interesting. He said, even though he could be against Trump on a lot of various economic things, how to run things, he just said he had to be with him on the trade issues and felt like England had to uh, stay on top of it and make sure things are balanced with China and to, to keep things on a more fair level if, if, if possible. And he said basically the entire world is waking up, they got to do the same thing. But uh, so I get it and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm actually for it, but I'm not convinced we've done it the right way, the best way. Um, and it just seems like to me, uh, we could be paying a price before we finally see enough benefit. I also I see some economists coming out with numbers showing that the average or median income for someone in China is like ten thousand a year, and I'm thinking, okay, that's a tremendous improvement where they were. They were like two thousand here a decade ago, so tremendous improvement. But relative to us, they're still a poor country, and I'm thinking, okay, uh, let's make sure that. You know, granted, we need a better deal for ourselves, but let's not overdo it and screw their economy up because it's just going to come back and screw our economy up as well. Yeah. Okay, so that's a good transition. So let's talk about let's talk about our economy for a little bit. Um, the whole world is just printing money like crazy. We we have six trillion dollars that we put out for um, relief um, for uh, coronavirus relief. We've also put out. Um, you know, we got this thing, the, uh, I don't remember what the scientific term was there in Iowa, but the, more or less the inland hurricane thing that we had sweep through Iowa that right. devastated about 14 million acres, about 8.7 million acres of corn and the remainder soybeans and a few other crops kind of thrown in the mix there. But it was, that was a, not only did it, was it just a crop issue, but we're talking like, you know, on, you know, storage issues, you know, getting, you know, bins getting destroyed, equipment getting destroyed. I mean, so there's, and it was a large scale area. I mean, it was just a massive amount of area they got they got uh, screwed up by that. So, I guess as you take a look at the overall U.S. economy, and let's kind of focus on that that uh, that Iowa area for a little bit. How you think that's going to affect what we see happening in the grain markets in long term? I guess as as the USDA starts making its um, you know September and October pr- um, Reports start coming out. There's going to be a big effect there as we start going into um, high moisture corn chopping season, and then uh, be picking corn here before too long. So, I guess as you take a look at that, what do you see happening there, and how do you kind of how are you positioning yourself in in, in you know in some commodities based around that storm? Yeah, uh, let's start with more like the micros economics here. Just looking at what happened in Iowa, and it, it's significant. For Iowans, uh, no question about it, some have got some devastated fields and they're going to be hurting financially for a while. Um, as always, when you zoom out and look at the nation, there's so many states that can produce so much, uh, you know, okay, it dilutes the impact. It's significant enough that I think um, 
I think Iowa alone is significant enough to help create a floor in prices here uh, going into next year. But it's there's actually a little bit bigger story than that that's, that's you know more important, and that is that we've seen some dry conditions uh, in August here that I think has has clipped the crops, uh, specifically corn, soybeans, and then it was it's really been a hot summer uh, from June all the way to now. Yep. We've been running with above normal temps. And for some of my followers on the podcast, I can go ahead and give, they've had plenty of time to get an understanding of what I was working on, so I can give it away for free now. I have something called a CPT model that basically says if the summer temp goes over a certain level, you're going to lose 5 to 30 bushel an acre. Or, right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. So a big impact, significant. And it's basically saying temperature is more important than precipitation, but even though the model is not used precipitation, whenever I'm discussing it and, and fretting over what, you know, is it going to work this time? I'm comparing it to precipitation. And early July put a warning out to followers that June was incredibly hot uh, compared to history. And that would just change the entire summer average so that we better cool things down or we were going to get a signal that there's a crop problem this year. And I was rather shocked how quickly things progressed. The model basically moved from like a green light saying, you better assume yield near record, if not record. And it went to a yellow light saying, well, it might not be record. And you better keep watchful. You better pay attention. And by mid-July, you know, it's just probably a week and a half later or something, it moved to red. It just said, you're going to have lower yield. You're not going to get a record yield. And uh, I just, I was just shocked how quickly it did that. Well, by the first week of August, temperatures were cool enough. They were incredibly cool. I was shocked how cool it was. It actually moved it back to like a yellow light. And I thought, I'll bet this thing finishes the end of the year and the crop's okay. And then that second week of August, it just turned around another abrupt change, put it right back to the red, and it's never let up. And now throwing in the precipitation and looking at some other things I've learned over the years and tricks and other types of models, I just feel like even if it wasn't hot enough, the model's probably going to be right anyways because of the precipitation. So my forecast uh, that I put out here recently um, is that um, – I, I don't think the yield's coming in as a record yield for the U.S. So I say USDA is coming off that 181.8. And now in just recent days, and especially since the Iowa hurricane, if you will, yeah. um, it, it uh, you know, everybody's now everybody's going the other way. They're, they're, they're dropping them in the pro farmer tour come out uh, 177 something. And I immediately tweeted and I don't care what you think of their accuracy, but by golly, I think they're on the right track here. Right. <laughs> And uh, so now my problem is uh, the model has got a the model showing this year is rather a strange setup compared to the prior two years because this isn't based on trend line yield. I could care less whether it's below trend line, above trend line. It's really comparing what was the last year, and then as a backup, it compares to whatever the record yield is. And the problem is we've got a new setup I've never seen before in this model. And this model is tested all the way back to year 2000. It's been 100% correct. And uh, the problem is it's saying it's a little bit different setup. And if we didn't have that setup, I'd actually be forecasting a 167.3 year a little lower. And that's, I must admit, even I don't think it's really that. <laughs> but that's what it would trigger. But with this setup, it's saying, no, don't, don't take it one step at a time. Be, be cautious here. So I'm kind of going it'll be below record, but might be in the low 170s somewhere mm -hmm. is where I'm guessing. So I take this information, plug it into my pricing model, which the pricing model can run by itself and predict prices very accurately, but you like to check and balance. You like to know more. Why is something going to occur here? And as I plug it in, I'm even more convinced we probably have found a floor price uh, in corn and soybeans uh, for quite some time, uh, maybe wheat. I think our seasonals that normally turn up from harvest into summer, and some years it doesn't work because we have too much supply or the demand is soft because of a poor economy, and we have all those things against us. But it's looking to me like maybe the seasonal connection to work a little better this time of moving up from harvest into summer. And even though I'm still anticipating a little harvest pressure coming here, um, and I will get some sell signals uh, in a, probably a few weeks, but I must say the model was very accurate as saying on that August 12th report, go get them, buy corn, buy soybeans, buy wheat, buy everything, just go for it. And, uh, boy, as of today, there was a real nice call. And in addition, uh, at the beginning of last week, I think it was, we were looking for a little dip last week. 
and I put out another thing on a, on a more shorter term signal, something where you might be buying, selling every month, that kind of thing. And the signal was that, hey, this thing's bottomed out ahead of schedule. Go get them. It's going higher. And I'm glad I didn't wait any longer <laughs> of, uh, given the signal because it just started marching up immediately that, that day. And so another nice sugar signal on top of that. And, of course, a lot of people are saying, well, farmers have had a great recovery here. They ought to sell, sell, sell. Well, I'm just going to stick with my model, and it will give signals. It gives several signals a year regardless if it's a – super bullish year or super bearish, still going to give sell signals, still going to give buy signals. And I'll still issue those. But I think the concerns of trying to move a lot of grain and sell way out, uh, I'm not in that group. I'll, I'll take my chances and try to work prices higher in the summer. So with the things going on in China weather and the gorgeous dam, what they're doing with the exports, even if it might be politically driven and goes away, I just feel like there's enough business there in the world, and hopefully the global economy is recovering, even though the viruses are starting, the cases are starting to move up again. And by the way, I have an experimental model that uh, gave a signal. I put a tweet out here this weekend. It's saying next four to eight weeks, the viruses, virus cases will increase in this country. And over the weekend, I started hearing from various sources, even our daughter who's in an Asian country, uh, was saying, boy, this stuff's coming back. Uh, there's there's some concerns here. And uh, so, yeah, we got all those things that could be good headwinds, yet somehow I feel like, you know what, the global economy is just going to chug along here and get better and better over time. And the U.S. is putting the pieces back together and we'll kind of move along. Uh, so it's difficult for me, uh, even though I will put out so signals and grains, it's difficult to me to be seriously bearish. I, th- I think we have probably are seeing some kind of floor built in here. Uh, for the grains, and I think it's probably worth a gamble of following that old-fashioned seasonal trend that could work prices higher into next summer. You know, uh, We'll have to worry about early next year when Brazil and Argentina come back online if they're gigantic crops. Well, maybe I'll have to rethink some things, uh, especially if the virus is still lingering and holding us back. But uh, I can be a bit of an optimist for uh, higher prices here, Casey. Now, as far as, uh, as far as the economy, I kind of went off the board there on just commodities and the weather and stuff. But, uh, you know, I'm very convinced the economy is going to grow into 2028 to 2031. And that's when we will once again hit, hit a ceiling when we just can't borrow anymore, take on any more debt, and things will be too expensive and labor might be too expensive. And the economy running great, but... You can just see you get into what's called peak economy. It's great, but you have nowhere to go but down, and it really doesn't take much to knock you down. Mm-hmm. So we'll probably get a primary recession then, and the economy will get, be knocked down. Commodities might take a little hit there, and the stock's probably a much bigger hit, and we'll start all over again. It's a, it's a cyclical thing, and the economy normally grows for about 7 to 12 years. That's the primary thing I'm betting on here. Now, having said that, we could have headwinds and problems all the way through next year, because some of this research, it doesn't necessarily, you really have to work hard at trying to pick the day of some kind of bottom. It can give you a very wide range saying, well, you know, you might get a start and then you have to back off and you get another start. We could have issues going into next year, but my guess is after next year, we should be free and clear and, and, and the economy should be growing. And the interesting thing is the global economy, even though it can do things ahead of the U.S. And, la- and after the U.S., and, of course, it's a whole group of countries, so it gets a little fuzzy sometimes around these tops and bottoms. But basically, the global economy should do the same thing. It should, auto- it should improve in the next 7 to 12 years. And I think, and maybe I'm too hopeful here and don't have enough uh, analysis and data to back me up on it, but I think the European economy, at least, if not the global economy, should do better in the next several years than what they did during the 2010s. And we really need that. If we can get that, it's going to help global demand for commodities. And you might think differently. You might be saying, well, wait a minute. If those other countries are doing better and they're producing commodities, aren't they just going to grab it? Well, it's, it's rather interesting. It doesn't really work that way. The U.S. will get its fair share more, especially if we can get a lower dollar. And I am bearish the dollar over the next three or four years. I don't know how accurate I'll be into next year. There's some little crazy things where the dollar could snap back up on us, but I think ultimately uh, the dollar is going to work lower and eventually it's actually going to help us uh, with not only with our exports, but just help pull up our economy to get us out of this uh, uh, this virus recession. So I'm bullish, I'm bullish in the economy, but again, we might have a lot of complications and hesitations here and worries. Are we really on, on uh, track or not? 
I think uh, I'm bullish the stock market. I've done extremely well. I can't believe my long-term programs like up over 80% gain. Wasn't expecting anything like that. But, uh, hey, I got the right signal. I had the courage to do it, went for it, and, and I've informed all our followers on it, how to keep up with it. Uh, so I think uh, I think I have to be optimistic and looking farther out. But, I, you know, it still bothers me. Can this whole virus stuff blow up on us again? And is that going to cause another economic issue? And there was even someone over in the Federal Reserve. I don't know if they're with the Federal Reserve now or not, but they made some comment, you know, could we get a second recession next year? And yes, my models are saying that. Of course, I'm, I'm not convinced we're truly out of this one yet. We, got to, we need a lot of improvement. So I don't know as I truly call it a second recession as much as maybe we're at risk of a setback next year. But again, looking farther out, I got to be optimistic. I got to be bullish that um, we're going to improve uh, commodity demand, improve our exports, and we'll improve our um, our overall economy. And like I say, I think the uh, the global economy can do better as well. How, um, how concerned are you about inflation? With I mean, just world, uh, not just necessarily I'm, I'm, U.S. but worldwide inflation because. You yeah, know, I'm, I'm an inflation bull, and okay. uh, and I've been discussing this for what seems like several years now. That we were we were going to put a, that the the economies would place a super cycle bottom in inflation, and over the years I was trying to narrow it down, and I thought you know it's going to have something to do with the recession that I had been forecasting for 2018 to 2020, and I finally got it, and it was on time, and yes, it was more severe than I. Uh, thought I was leaning the other way, saying the Federal Reserve will be able to beat this and we'll have just a mild recession. And then, of course, we got a fundamental that no one's used to and made it worse. And I'm fine with that because it proved the model right, even though I might not have had the complete story, right? And so I'm fine with it. I think that uh, basically we're putting in a super cycle bottom in interest rates right now. Uh, I made a call, in fact, to, for my subscribers and my own analysis uh, during the month of August. Uh, that we found a super cycle bottom. But I will warn you, I'm going to be wrong a few to several times now in the next year because next year is, is the last year for it. And if you're wondering why would you allow such length of time, well, you've got to realize this thing is trying to find the end of a 40-year period of lower interest rates. So I think it's okay to have one or two years where you're trying to throw the dart and find the bottom. You know, uh, I mean, that was a major a lengthy decline in interest rates for the U.S. and the world, for that matter. And uh, so I think we're coming close. And the thing is, inflation for the U.S. probably bottomed back in the 2008-2009 Great Recession. Uh, but I have, you know, I, I need to wait a year or two to get all the data in and see where was the annual inflation rate like for this year. Maybe I'll learn it had been lower, but it doesn't matter. I would just the model's just immediately going to say, "Okay, it wasn't back then." You know what? It's here now, and even more confident, and even higher probability. And I'll just call it again. My gut feeling is probably the low back in two thousand eight, two thousand held, and inflation improved somewhat. And it stalled out. And as you know, for several years here, the Fed has been frustrated. It can't get inflation to two percent, which is its target. And it's it's uh, but it's now moving higher off of the now for this recession is kind of a crazy thing. We got greatest amount of unemployment since the 1930s Great Depression, so people are hurting. Yet uh, in some pockets, people are making darn good money and spending it, doing very well. A lot of real estate home sales are doing fantastic in some regions, and at the grocery store, even we're seeing the prices rise. Right. So this virus recession actually caused a bit of inflation, which is a sad thing, especially for people who are unemployed or they're not making much money. But nevertheless, I, I think uh, inflation's probably already uh, turned up as well with interest rates if it did not bottom several years ago. Now, my forecast is that inflation and interest rates will rise somewhat together over the next 15 to 25 years. And the reason, and I think the leader would be inflation and interest rates the follower, and it's basically just the banking system's way of trying to make up for a higher cost of inflation. And uh, and lucky for them, because a lot of us don't have a way of increasing our paycheck to cover our higher inflation costs, right? Yeah, And it's exactly. the thing sometimes with farmers uh, and, their, and their commodities, sometimes it, they don't move up as fast as inflation as well. But uh, so my, my thought is, yeah, you know, they'll, some will lead or lag. They can do different things, but generally they're going up the next 15 to 25 years. Well, that's significant because you've got generations, uh, younger generations of farmers, or you've got uh, stock traders, you've got investors, these high flash trading speculators. 
they're not used to several years of rising interest rates. So th this is an interesting shift. It's like business could be, you know, having to wake up this decade of some major changes that some of them haven't seen in a long time and others have never seen it. Now, it'll be interesting how people respond to that. Now, my gut feeling is interest rates and, and inflation are not going to increase like they've done in prior generations and prior super cycles. Um, I don't think we're headed for like 10% inflation like we had by 1980 or 70s. I don't think we're headed for 20% interest rates or 17% or interest rates like they had back then. I think this is going to be one of the smaller uh, bull markets in inflation interest rates. But I think it's going to occur. I think, I think I'll be right on the direction. I think the models and analysis will be right on the direction and the timing of it. But I'm not convinced it'll be a significant thing. So the odd thing is, I'm a bull. I'm saying, yes, I fully get buying gold and hang on to your real estate if you got it. But at the same time, I'm looking at some real estate saying, you know, it's still kind of high priced, uh, except for where it was hit by the virus recession. So I question how many things you really want to buy on inflation. And for people like farmers, miners, and uh, loggers, you know, I'll be a little cautious here of, of Oh, don't think that this inflation is just suddenly going to surge in the next two or three years and your commodities are going to soar. And keep in mind, even if your commodities are soaring, your input costs are probably soaring as well and your labor costs are going to soar. I'm not saying it can't happen because you can get into small periods of time where some crazy thing fell out of line and it's, it's, it's kind of like a transmission in a car and something goes wrong and you suddenly lost your third gear. Well, where do you go now? <laughs> you know? Right. Um, you could get something. I'm not. I'm definitely not going to say we're not going to see a surge inflation in the next two or three years. But I don't. I don't think so. I think it's a gradual thing to develop. If it does surge, you'll see it come back down quickly because it's probably going to hurt the economy, or the Fed may may uh, react to that quickly. Now, here's another thing. This this is um, last week. I'm glad we're talking about this because I some of this I haven't even talked to my followers yet on the idea of what did the Fed say last week. This is fascinating because this is what I've needed the, for several years now. I've, for, I've thought the Fed should not be using the 2% target rate and allow inflation to go higher than that before reacting. Don't get so rigid and don't keep it so low. And I felt like that was interfering in the commodity industry. It's interfering in other things, and it's actually creating some of the problems in our economy. Well, last week, the Fed came out, and I, I had heard rumblings of this for months now, but they came out and said they're probably going to go with an average inflation. That means inflation might go to two and a half to even three percent before they really pull the trigger and say, "Okay, we got to slow this down, and we're going to have to start tightening money. We're going to have to start raising interest rates." And of course, the markets won't like that; they'll get a little bit scared. But I find it interesting now that they can be more flexible, and I think they're learning just what I've learned over the past several years. The way our economy works, we're so creative, so productive. We work so hard that we keep the supplies up high enough to balance demand that it's very difficult for the middle class and poor to get enough money in their pockets where they can just start throwing it around and living life a bit easier. And that's where you create a lot of your higher inflation. So I think we've kind of rigged the system a bit where it's more difficult than ever to get inflation higher. And I think the Fed's woke up to that. I think they've been scratching their head for years. Why can't it go at least to 2%? If it gets to 2%, it backs right off. And so I think they said they better send a message to the economy and the people. We're not going to interfere and slow down this economy just because it goes to 2%. And I like that. But <laughs> that's also going to back up the inflation people, right? The inflation bulls. And I even like it. It tells me that you even got the Fed that could be changing the system, altering our transmission, fine-tuning the engine a little bit so that it can actually even help create and, and allow this inflation to, to turn about. So I, I'm just fascinated what happened last week. I thought, wow, well, this is going to work. This super cycle is going to turn higher, and we're going to have higher inflation. But again, there's a lot of other things going on in the his, looking back at the history of this country and the world. I, I question whether we're going to get super high inflation. And I'm sure there's going to be people out there writing books. They're going to be preaching. They're going to be speaking. <laughs> they're going to be online telling you why you got to own gold and Bitcoin and buy anything material. Uh, but I think they're, I think they're going to go too far. And the, the, there is such a thing called inflation cycle. And the inflation cycle basically means you get, in my opinion, you get a few to several decades of higher inflation, and you get a few to several decades of what's called disinflation. It's really just slower and slower inflation. 
And when you have, get high, when you look in the higher inflation trend, most of it's what we call early inflation, and it's actually a good thing. And I think it's actually going to help the middle class and poor, even though I realize they're going to pay more at the grocery store, they may actually get better paychecks that can help them counter that. I just think it's a better thing. And I think the Federal Reserve has woke up. Their, their comments last week were saying even in unemployment, they don't understand why some groups of unemployment aren't doing better. Why are some poor people doing better than others? Why aren't there... Why are some people in the middle class doing better than others? And they're trying to figure out how do we make a more fair system for everybody? And again, I think that's why they're going to keep the door open to to allow this inflation. But again, I, I think there's going to be some limits. I think if you're looking for super high inflation, it normally occurs in the late phase of that inflation trend. And it's normally the shorter number of years in my calculations is it probably won't get here to around mid 2030s to early 2040s. And uh, that's where inflation could really surge and get out of hand. And that's how we've done it in the past. But here again, I think we're so good at managing, manipulating our economy, maybe for better or worse. I'm not saying we're doing it correctly, but we do seem to be willing to try things. And the Fed certainly is. So they may even limit that, that late inflation phase where it really never even surges. But at the same time, I'm with these inflation people. My argument is how high of inflation and how fast, you know, mm-hmm. but I'm with them. I think we've turned a corner here. And I think we've printed enough money that I fully understand why some people are concerned the Fed really can't pull that money out. And normally they never would. They would just use interest rates to control it. They never truly take a bunch of money off the table and burn it and, hey, you can't have it. So there's a good... There's, I understand some people saying, well, that's $6 trillion, man, that's here to stay. That's a lot of money, and that's going to flow through the system eventually. Well, history is showing here in the last 20 years that money flows through a lot slower. It's it's really interesting. We've got a different system. But the Fed's comments make me think they're going to find a way to speed things up a bit. I, I think this, this is going to work. I'm pretty convinced of it. Uh, something else, when the Fed said they were concerned of some of the middle class and poor, why some aren't doing so well and others are, and they were also made a comment on unemployment that they were concerned the, Fed, the government is just too slow of getting any money into the hands of uh, just people. Okay, It's moving very quickly into businesses. But I think the Fed is concerned of where we're going for the future um, and what they want to – I think what they're going to do is possibly look at uh, where we each all have in, individual accounts where the Fed, if their computers suddenly say, this is a recession, the economy is falling apart, send money, the money is going to be sent that day into our own accounts. I don't know if they ever go that far, but there's talk of that. They didn't mention it last week, but there's been talk previously – actually looking at some things like that. So the Fed is determined to say, we're not going to let these recessions get out of hand. We're not going to let a depression. That, that could be fascinating where a computer just simply says, you know what, this economy's falling apart. Send money, send it now, and you're going to see it in 24 hours and, and that account, and you're going to be able to transfer it and spend it. That, that's going to be fascinating. Okay. Now, why is the Fed getting more aggressive? Well, just look at this virus recession. Anybody would say, what if we had another one of these? What if they get worse? And I've seen cyclical patterns and diseases and, oh, they can get worse and you can get one every decade and we could be setting up for another one in this decade. I don't know if it will or not. I know it's not as clearly defined as what I do like in the stock market. I have a lot more confidence forecast stock market than I will forecasting a disease. <laughs> but the point is that that possibility is there that we now up against things we've never had to deal with. That's still going to cause these same recessions that, uh, in other words, I have, I'm very confident my model is going to continue to correctly call recessions for the time. But the news behind it, the information may be uh, far more different than what I'm used to. Um, so I think we'll deal with that. Another thing is financially. You know, we've built a tremendous system. We have something to be proud of. I mean, we've got the biggest financial system in the world. We can print money like crazy, and it doesn't seem to truly destroy us. And we and business goes on, and we can build businesses faster than most countries. I mean, I'm just shocked. I mean, you used to have to – it took you to you were 65 to 75 years old to become a billionaire in this country, and now you can be a billionaire at the age of 25. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, you know, it's just amazing how everything is just speed, light, uh, fast-paced. Um, I, but if I look at it, it looks like being from 1980s to now, these recessions are actually starting to get worse. We, we were, we were managing them and controlling them and they're coming at us 
uh, faster when they do hit. And I almost think the pace is picking up a little bit, a little more per decade. I don't know. If, I don't know if we're truly there yet, but it, it makes me think of like you watch a movie and you see these people crossing a rope bridge over a gorge, you know. And 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 physics will tell you, well, if everybody walks the same way across the bridge, the bridge is going to start to vibrate, and that rope bridge can just start swinging wildly up and down, and pretty soon it just breaks the bridge and everybody falls off into the abyss. Well, I, th- I think the Fed's fully aware. I, especially, I think last fall. The Fed woke up saying, wow, we, we got another issue here where this whole financial system could uh, fall apart. And it had to do with overnight interest rates. And it was really just normal seasonal stuff that would have occurred that time of year anyways. They were just wrapping up the year. But for some strange reason, those banks, the way they did things, it made it worse than you would normally expect and just came at us much faster. And the Fed jumped on it quickly. And I think it just scared them that instead of just saying, well, this is just a banking thing, don't worry about it. Uh, I think they decided, you know, let's prop up the entire economy and help out. Well, it was kind of a good thing in a way. I I was against it at first, but it kind of prepared them, I think, for this virus recession to make sure you, as soon as you see anything that can upset the economy, move fast. And so uh, I'm thoroughly convinced by 2040s, we probably will see a crash in commodity stocks, farmland, (laughs) everything, just because I could see these things building up worse and worse. The weird thing about it is in between those, we're probably going to have record size economies in great times. So, you know, you, you get out there, you do business, you be an optimist anyways, and go get them and make something of yourself. And But just realize that you're going to still have things called recessions. You're going to have economic impacts. You're going to see markets go down at times, you know. And, uh, you touched on this a little bit in, in what you're talking about there when you're looking at gold. So if you listen to people like Peter Schiff and, and you know, he's – Everything is need gold, 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 and lots of it. And um, and for those of you who don't know who Peter Schiff is, he's a he has a fund, and he kind of he called the uh, 2008 crash of the uh, housing market, and uh, he's banging that drum again about what's happening here now. And, and you know, take a look at like what Warren Buffett's done here in the last couple of weeks with jumping into gold, um, not necessarily physical gold itself, but but gold mining stocks and what that looks like. So I guess as you as you look at gold and Bitcoin and those kind of things, are those, I mean, what's your thought on that? I mean, I know most, most investors tell you to have, you yeah, know, 15 I just to 25% of that. Bought on Friday on gold. And uh, normally I don't invest in gold myself because I'm so wrapped up in the stock market. And, I'm, and when I say wrapped up, I'm like 200% invested when I am invested mm. and I can flip overnight to zero. So, uh, you know, it's just how I do things and it works well for me. Uh, so generally I just simply don't have any time or money to, to invest in something else, but I have to analyze all these things because I have people that want to know and they pay me for it. And I also want to see how that relates to stock market. But I must say I bought some gold on uh, Friday as well. And it's been quite some time. My younger days, I used to get up at two or three o'clock in the morning and trade Hong Kong gold. So it's not that I don't like gold. It's just over the years, personally, I got more involved in the stock market and sometimes some corn, soybean, I, I will personally trade those. Uh, but most of it is uh, my personal money is in the, in the stock market. And then I analyze commodity stocks, dollar, interest rates, anything, everything, weather, try to put it all together. Any rate, I thought I'd take a chance here and uh, buy some gold and just see what happens. Because I've been lo- a super long-term bull in gold since the 2000s, uh, thinking gold's going higher into that 2030s, 2040s. And it might just explode in those final years off that late inflation, that final surge. And then it may crash right along with everything else for all I know. I don't know. That's, that's a long ways out yet. Uh, but I think I think we have fine evidence of super cycles working still in gold. Now, you can break that down into long-term trends that last only a few years. You can break that down into trading kind of trends during the, the year. And we just had one of those signals uh, that um, the golden wolf. So, you know, I'll put a stop under the recent lows last few weeks. I'm not going to let it run down by a huge amount. Down if they decide to dump it, but uh, I, I would not rule out record high prices for gold uh, several times from now through the end of next year and even over the next several years, right? Uh, I can see it, and there's some people out there that I respect that are using around $2,400 for Target, but you, you've always had the diehard gold bugs that love, <laughs> no, they talk $10,000 gold. Well, to me, none of that makes sense. 
but I'm not going to tell them not to buy gold because uh, they can still be right even if it never goes as high as they thought, you know. Right. And uh, so you got to manage your risk. I mean, we had a big run up. I mean, my gold model uh, gave a buy signal back in June, and it worked very well. I mean, I'm looking at chart right now, and the signal is around 1730, and if I remember correctly, and prices moved up to above 2000 for a record high. I mean, on the futures, it got up to like 2080. They've pulled back recently, and if they will – uh, close higher this week. I think I'm probably on the right track. I, from what I see from some of the more, more what I call clever people in the hedge fund industry, they don't seem to have huge amounts of gold. They want some. Uh, they have at least a few percentage of their over portfolio. And remember, they manage billions, so they got a few percentage points of those billions that's in gold. And some of them that it said they probably never buy Bitcoin and bought Bitcoin, and they're only they're only doing like one or two percent in Bitcoin, but they, they want both because they could see that the two could lead and lag one another and basically move up. And I cannot argue with that. I, I would have several years ago because I didn't feel like we were really on board for an inflation trend, even though it was coming. But today, uh, I can fully understand why people get very excited trading gold. Um, I don't I don't study the rest of the metals anymore. It really doesn't help me versus grain, stock market, economy or anything. Um, you want to be a bit cautious there. They can be inflationary driven, but that may be a few years down the road. They're going to have their own supply and demand right now. Silver, of course, really finally woke up. I felt it was sad for so many years of silver basically being stomped on. And so silver's woke up, but now do you dare buy that thing? It went straight up. So <laughs> I don't know right. if I would, but uh, I think gold could be that more logical kind of market compared to the others that might get too bullish too fast and then they got to crash and then they got to start over gold could be more sustainable because it seems to me many different types of investors businesses bankers whatever they all talk about having some gold you know and uh so i like it and we'll see what we'll get if you know even if it goes down next week or two my my guess is the model say okay that's just a bigger correction but nothing has changed long term okay and, Let's talk about one last thing here and just kind of overall look at the economy is uh, how oil prices are stacking up um, post-COVID, right? So we've kind of bounced back and West Texas was uh, looked like it was it was kind of on, you know, around 43 bucks. Brent crude's around 45 bucks. There's a, there's a pretty tight margin there. But as you look at oil prices and, and, and the way people are, are getting back to work and more and more things are opening up, more people are driving and what have you. What's your thought on the oil market and how it relates to the overall economy? Yeah, uh, basically, um, so I've got my weekly continuous chart here and uh, oil bottomed in April and I tried to actually bottom for a leverage fund. It was like a you lose twice as much and uh, gain twice as much compared to just buying the oil and uh, it got caught up in that final swing where prices actually went negative mm -hmm. in the futures market and my fund didn't get clipped like that it just came down in sympathy because it wasn't the only way you would have got nailed with those negative prices is you were in a contract going right into those final days of expiration in my opinion 99 percent of investors shouldn't be there anyways <laughs> okay right so it was kind of its own little niche in there but it did throw me off analytically. I didn't think you could have a commodity below zero so that's something uh, and really you didn't and, and the actual commodity but you did on the futures rate. And so at any rate, got on my fund and said, but you know, this thing's going to come back. And Phil, I was looking at some gap back in March, and I said, this thing's going to come roaring back to, to 40 bucks. Well, it did. It, it, it took about six weeks. And unfortunately, I got so tied up in buying even more stocks and leveraging myself to the hilt that I didn't, <laughs> didn't get back into my oil fund. And lo and behold, the oil fund did just fine. I never should have uh, paid any attention to that negative uh, price on the future so there's one of my little slip ups i don't mind giving away some of the things that happened along the way here uh but a uh it really the the oil markets performed like it was supposed to it was supposed to snap back fill that gap but the interesting thing is over the past uh, eight weeks here the market really hasn't moved much it got some volatility on a daily basis but it's really just in a range that's slowly creeping higher and i i think you uh, found a price level that the supply and demand are balanced and they're now asking themselves, are we really on path to growing this economy and get back all of this gasoline demand? And we have seen some evidence that's come back pretty fast at times here, but we're not completely back. And uh, so to me, 
I don't doubt oil is going higher later. I don't know how well it'll jump on board this inflation stuff. That that may take it a while, and I'll have to worry about its own own supply here. But I think, uh, to me, the, 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 uh, to, uh, frankly, I think the market's acting strong, even though it really hasn't gone anywhere in the last eight weeks. I think it's acting strong. That um, that it feels. Uh, I think they're making a big bet here. That yes, we'll pull through this virus recession. The economies are going to be fully recovered here in a, another year or two. And we're going to be okay. So I'm convinced there's some bulls eyeing $60 oil right now. And I don't blame them. But, you know, at the same time, oil, uh, about 10 years ago, it used to be kind of just separate. It was a commodity. A lot of the Wall Streeters and economists wouldn't even pay much attention to it. And about 10 years ago, oil started working its way into models for even the stock market and working the way into the economy. And they didn't like it if oil, if there was a tremendous amount of oil and the price came down a lot, they actually viewed it as possibly hurting the economy or that it was at least some kind of clue the economy was going to be in trouble. And there is an old saying. I mean, a lot of people say, oh, the commodities don't have anything to do with the economy unless you get them super high price and, and hurt the consumer. Well, there's been some saying that, you know, your commodities can be too low and you got a poor economy. You need to rethink things and that maybe you're better off at a little higher commodities, <laughs> okay? And I think that's where the oil market is right now is it's trying to decide where are we going next with this virus recession. I think it's convinced it it's has seen the lowest price and a little heads up of what I'm going to be working on uh, this next week for my uh, subscribers is I, I, I think – so uh, the oil just put in a super cycle bottom. That's going to call it an 18-year cycle or some kind of – or I'll give it some other name sometimes and not use numbers. But um, that's to me, says oil may not go nonstop higher all the way in the year 2028 like the stock market because, after all, we can't afford it as consumers. And there's still plenty of supply out there, and we could have more if we want it. But what it does tell us is there's a good chance we won't see oil below 20 bucks over the next 7 to 10 years. And so it's at least a trader's market. Uh, you can make some good money trading oil two or three times uh, a year, I think. And there may be a chance setting on it for uh, longer periods of time than that. Would I buy it and set on it for 10 years? Probably not. I think you'd be disappointed too many times along the way, even if you're right in the end. You know? um, I think for heavy energy users uh, and perhaps even farmers, and frankly, if there was a way to have be hedged in the next few years of oil, I'd kind of like to do that. I'm not so sure about this particular price. I personally wish oil would dip a little bit, but it acts like it's well supported. Um, I think they're convinced oil is worth more than this, and they just got to get the economy doing better uh, to help support it. Um, and so we'll see. We've got some interesting economic numbers coming up here next week on uh, PMIs. Uh, that's a monthly gauge of how manufacturing and services are doing. And that'll help us with the economy, and I suspect the oil people will be taking a look at that. And I suspect a lot of economists will not only look at PMIs, but they'll be looking at oil and comparing it to gold and comparing it to the dollar, and then reevaluate uh, what they think's going on in the country as far as uh, the consumers and businesses. Well, good stuff, man. We've been going here for a little while, and <clears throat> I think we've kind of hit the highlights and stuff I want to talk about. Anything out there that you want to make sure people know about, Rich, before we shut down? Uh, no, as far, as far as my podcast, give it a chance, uh, criticalpoint.podbean.com. You can find me on Twitter at uh, Rich underscore Pawson. Um, I also have another one at Richard underscore Pawson. So you'll be able to search me. Um, but at least uh, in the next few weeks here, we've got some interesting things going on in the grains and the stock market. Um, and, of course, I just put out a signal in gold, so I'm going to be paying close attention to that and manage that as well as I can. Uh, so some nice discussion coming here, but a lot of people are wondering about these grains of, uh, you know, how long can it go up? And that's really what my model is more interested in. Instead of trying to pick that magical price, it's really more interested in how long will it go up? How long will it go down? When is the next turn? Um, and it really can pick up on when do the buyers have, when have, when have they bought enough? And there was a lot of concern last week at the soybeans that maybe they had bought enough. And my model is saying, I think I'll hold out for a little bit more here. Uh, we'll see what we get this next week. So anyways, uh, yeah, I encourage anybody who's not already a subscriber to uh, take a look at my site. I do try to put up quite a bit of free stuff, and that should give you an idea where you're going. And the, if you sign up for it, uh, the billing cycle is delayed by two weeks. So if you sure were to stop it and <laughs> cancel it before two weeks, you got yourself a free trial. But 
frankly, I think price wise and my analysis showing something different than everybody else, but it's not, I'm not trying to compete against. I have fellow analysts, economists, traders subscribe to my stuff and I look at their stuff. It really is something that can complement and help out. Uh, with all this news and information that sometimes comes at us too fast and is too much and it gets confusing. And uh, this thing can at least give you an idea that, you know, when my model says, you know what, they bought enough, you better look out because I don't care if no one wants to sell anything or not. It's only going to take a couple sellers to bring down a trillion dollar market. It's, it's bizarre how it works. If that demand stops cold, it's going to come down, you know, and, and, and vice versa. We just saw that in the grains now with, with some of this weather markets and stuff. Um, look how quickly they turned around when they were going down for six months straight and just turned on a dime. And you just reached a level where they're done selling and it doesn't take much to make it go up. And now I think we got a little bit of a change here on the news and fundamentals uh, where I question if the grains will go back down, back down to the lows I'm talking now uh, for the year that is. Um, so anyways, yeah, criticalpoint.podbean.com. Check out what I've got to say. And the nice thing is it's not just audio. I do the video so you can actually see it on a chart and you can see how things have worked in the past and you can see how what I'm projecting in the future and then you can decide whether you're going to have high, low confidence or take the signal or not and, and move forward. Well, thanks, Rich. Thanks for being on. I'd really encourage everyone to go check out the podcast and just see what he's got out there and, and follow him on uh, Twitter. Great information out there. Rich is a wealth of knowledge, and uh, he uh, he calls a lot of stuff uh, right with his with his models that he has. So, Rich, thanks for being on the podcast, man. Thank you, Casey. All right. I'm Casey Seymour with Moving Iron Podcast. Make sure you check me out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram for all the latest podcasts as they get released. Also, any blogs I have posted as well. Um, check out the Global Ag Network and the great podcasters out there. And also check out the Moving Iron LLC website. That's movingironllc.com. That's where you can find all the latest information about the Moving Iron podcast as well as the Moving Iron Summit coming up in Nashville, Tennessee, January 20th through the 22nd of, of uh, 2021. Uh, a lot of great information there, great speakers. We had to cancel and postpone the one we've had uh, scheduled up here for uh, – September 1st, just due to due to social distancing reasons with uh, the hotel there in Nashville. But uh, we're back on track here for January. So um, with that, I am Casey Seymour with uh, Rich Possum. Let's go do some iron, folks. Out. Moving iron in the 21st century.